We want to welcome you back for the 2020 season with our annual review of IFAB's changes to the laws of the game. It's been about three years since IFAB made any kind of massive alterations to the laws, which means they were due, and this year we have some very significant adjustments and changes to both the laws and the interpretations of them. As a result, this year's law changes are going to be broken down into three parts. The first part will cover a majority of the changes that were made, most of which are fairly small and straightforward. The second part will discuss the rules regarding administration of cards to team officials like coaches. This seems like a simple rule change, but there are a lot of nuances to how and when cards may be given to team officials, and therefore it deserves its own topic. The final part will explore the clarification on the interpretation of the handling clause in Law 12. IFAB has made dramatic and extensive clarifications to handling that, while not putting everything in black and white, is going to make it far more clear what defines a handling offense. Let's begin. A rather crucial change was made to Law 3 for 2019-20 that is designed to speed up play with regards to the mechanics of substitution. Traditionally, when a substitution occurs, the player being substituted must first step off the field, and only then may the substitute step onto the field. This is to ensure that only 11 players, or fewer in the event of send-offs, are on the field for one team at any given moment. Teams traditionally would manage their substitutions by having their substituted players depart the field directly into their technical area or by jogging to the halfway line where the substitutes were waiting to come on. While this kept the process orderly, many teams would use substitutions to exploit this delayed technique and waste time. The substituted player would turn and clap to the fans or walk slowly to the halfway line or technical area, running seconds off the clock while everybody waited for him or her to depart the field. Those days are now over. The change to Law 3 this year mandates that the substituted player is to leave the field at the nearest boundary line unless the referee gives that substitute permission to leave elsewhere for safety, security, or injury reasons. The new mechanic for substitution will involve the following. 1. The team indicates that they want to substitute by having their substitute or substitutes at the halfway line when the ball goes out of play, and if substitution rules limit stoppages where they may be made, a specific stoppage when substitution is allowed. 2. The referee halts the restart and identifies the player or players who are being substituted for. 3. Those players are politely advised to leave the field at the closest boundary line. 4. As each substituted player departs the field, his or her substitute is then told by the assistant referee or the referee that he or she can enter. 5. The substituted players make their way around the field to their technical area immediately and without delay. What does this mean for the majority of games that we work? First of all, keep in mind that the players are usually distinctly unaware of significant changes to the laws, which means don't get snippy with players in your youth games or adult amateur games when they try to take the long walk. Sure, maybe they are trying to waste time, but if they didn't know that they now have to depart the field at the closest boundary line, jumping down their throats is not going to help your game management. We are going to have to repeatedly, calmly, and patiently remind players to leave the field at the closest spot. Don't get angry. Be polite. Explain this is a new rule for this year. Most players are not going to know this. If you have to repeatedly tell a player to not cross the field to depart in a single instance of a substitution, meaning that the player appears to be deliberately ignoring your request to leave at the nearest boundary line, now you are empowered to caution that player for delaying the restart of play. Please keep in mind that the actions of the player should appear to be purposely delinquent. Let's not go whipping a yellow card out every time some player does not step off the field at the closest point on a substitution. There are a few other caveats to the modifications to the substitution aspect of Law 3. First, Please note the language regarding departure at the closest point allows for an exception if there are safety or security reasons. Let's say you're working a heated youth match and the parents have been a bit riled up. Red 12 has been called for tackles on hard challenges and blue parents have made a few comments bordering on inappropriate. Red decides to substitute 12 off on a stoppage where he happens to be right in front of the blue parents. 
This is probably not an ideal moment to ask Red 12 to step off the field at the closest boundary line, so that he or she now has to walk right past the blue parents on his or her way back to the technical area. While it certainly falls on the shoulders of those parents and Red 12 to not cause anything, well, a little common sense and preventative officiating can nearly eliminate the potential for such a blow-up to occur. Similarly, if the game has been testy and Red 12 has stirred the pot with a few blue players who are now on their bench, maybe we don't have Red 12 leave the field so that he or she has to walk behind the blue bench on the way back to his or her technical area. Remember, we can always add time, and adding 15 to 30 seconds is a small price to pay to avoid the paperwork of reporting red cards or spectator misconduct later. Second, it remains entrenched in the rules that a player is not required to leave the field when a team wishes to substitute him or her. If that player refuses to leave the field, the substitution is canceled and play continues. The 2019 Carabao Cup final in England had such an instance where Chelsea tried to substitute its goalkeeper just before the match entered kicks on the mark, and the goalkeeper refused to leave. As an official, that's not your problem. You inform the team there will be no substitution as the player refuses to depart, and then you restart the game. Leave it to the team to decide what to do with the delinquent player after the game. Rules are rules. Law 4 has a minor modification saying that if a team is wearing short sleeve jerseys that have a pattern instead of a dominant color, long sleeves worn under that jersey may duplicate the pattern as well instead of a dominant color. I don't expect to see this come up very often. In Minnesota, there are only a few competitions for which we expect enforcement of the undershirt color rules such as State Cup, President's Cup, and NPSL North Conference games. Probably the best example I can provide of this is if the Croatian national team wore their checkerboard jerseys, they now could wear a long sleeve shirt under a short sleeve version of the jersey that had checkerboards on the long sleeves. Again, probably not something we're going to see a lot of, but it's a change. There is a subtle but important change to Law 5. Traditionally, if a player was guilty of misconduct, but the ball went out of play, and then play was restarted before any misconduct was administered, the misconduct could no longer be administered unless 1. The misconduct was a send-off level offense, and 2. An assistant referee had raised the flag and stood at attention through the dead ball and ensuing restart. If the infraction was a cautionable offense, the caution could not be administered at all. An update to Law 5 now permits both cautions and send-offs to be given for prior offenses after the game is restarted as long as another match official had tried to communicate to the referee before play was restarted. Let's say a player is guilty of unsporting behavior for game disrepute. Say there's a challenge right in front of one of the ARs as the ball goes out for a throw-in and the blue player turns and tells the red player something impolite about his mother. The assistant referee raises the flag to let the referee know, but the throne is taken quickly and the referee does not see the flag. The assistant referee can now put the flag down and resume regular duties. Two minutes later, the ball goes out of play again, this time for a goal kick. Under this modification, the assistant may now bring the incident to the attention of the referee, and the blue player can be cautioned for unsporting behavior even though the match has restarted. The restart does not come back to that original infraction. The game would still restart in this example with the goal kick. Another smaller change to Law 5 is in regards to the requirement that an injured player has to leave the field for treatment. You may recall several years ago this rule was modified slightly for when the player was injured as the result of a challenge that resulted in an opponent being booked. In that situation, the player could remain on the field for treatment and then remain in the game. A new modification now permits the player to be treated and stay on the field if A, the ensuing restart is a penalty kick, and B, the player who is injured is going to take the penalty kick. This now allows an injured player to be able to take a penalty kick if he or she is capable of continuing immediately. Law 7 has added language for what are called cooling breaks, in addition to the pre-existing drinks breaks. IFAB explains that drinks breaks are for hydration and are limited to 60 seconds while cooling breaks are 90 seconds to as long as 3 minutes and are to allow body temperature to drop on hot and humid days. Considering the fact that anybody taking a cooling break is probably going to get a drink as well, I honestly do not understand why they didn't just say that water breaks can now be up to 3 minutes. Who knows? Moving on. 
Law 8 has modified the kickoff slightly so that now the team winning the coin toss can choose side or can choose to kick off. The theory is that a team might consider it an advantage to have a kickoff. Frankly, all this does is bring IFAB in line with the American scholastic rules, high school and college. On one hand, it's nice to see everybody using the same rules, and it's nice that teams now have more choices. On the other hand, much like the cooling break modification, this doesn't exactly solve climate change. Moving on. IFAB has finally made some common sense adjustments to the drop ball rule in order to eliminate some of the bickering and idiocy that develops from these restarts. If the ball was last touched by a player in one of the penalty areas, or if the ball is in one of the penalty areas when play is stopped with a drop ball restart to ensue, the dropped ball is dropped for the goalkeeper and only the goalkeeper in that penalty area. If the drop ball restart is applied when the ball was last touched or is outside of a penalty area, the ball is dropped for one and only one player of the team that last touched the ball. Aside from the player for whom the ball is being dropped, all other players must now be at least four meters, that is four and a half yards, from the dropped ball. This rule change means the days of challenged drop balls are now officially over. Every drop ball can involve one and only one player. The four meter requirement is far enough away to guarantee that the player for whom the ball is dropped will easily be able to play at first, but close enough that a ball drop just outside of a penalty area can quickly be challenged to avoid an easy scoring chance. Seriously, this is such a massive improvement on drop balls that we all should be shooting off fireworks in celebration. No more getting kicked in the shins by crazed 10 year olds who think that this is a hockey face off. Related, we need to remind everybody that the rule dictating that the ball must touch a second player from a drop ball before entering either goal remains in effect. Say you have a drop ball to the attacking team just outside of a penalty area, the player receiving the drop ball cannot kick the ball into the goal from the drop or take a short touch and then shoot and be awarded a goal. Law 9 has a significant change related to the ball touching the referee or the assistants. If the ball now hits a match official resulting in a promising attack for either team, the ball goes off the match official into either goal or the touch causes a turnover of possession, play is immediately halted, and a dropped ball is given to the team that touched the ball prior to the match official touching it or the goalkeeper if the touch occurs in a penalty area. This change eliminates inadvertent referee assists, which certainly is a significant improvement in the fairness of the laws. Keep in mind that if A, no promising attack results from the contact with the match official, and B, there is no goal scored or possession change as a result of the contact, play should continue anyway. There is a small change to Law 10 stating that a goalkeeper may not score a goal against the opposing team by throwing the ball into the opponent's goal directly. In the unlikely event that this were to happen, a goal kick would be awarded. I suppose this rule was implemented in the event that Mike Trout or Patrick Mahomes decided to take up goalkeeping. Let's just move on. There are a few small adjustments to Law 12 outside of the ones that we will discuss in the other law change presentations. The goalkeeper is now permitted to pick up the ball after a back pass if the goalkeeper first unsuccessfully attempts to play the ball with his or her feet. Say a defender passes the ball with his or her foot back to the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper now attempts to kick the ball with his or her feet to a teammate or clear the ball up the field but flubs the attempt and now an attacker is bearing down on the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper is now permitted to pick this ball up to end the threat only because the goalkeeper made an honest attempt to honor the back pass rule by trying to kick the ball first. The key to this rule change is that the goalkeeper must try to kick the ball. Simply trapping the pass with the feet is not kicking the ball. There must be an attempted clearance that fails before the goalkeeper handles the ball to avoid an indirect free kick offense. There is a significant mechanic change regarding the issuing of cards and restarts. Traditionally, if the ball goes out of play and a card has to be administered, the referee must turn the restart ceremonial and first administer the card. A change to Law 13 this year now permits a quick free kick to be taken in such scenarios as long as a scoring opportunity is presented and the referee has not started the misconduct procedure. 
Let's say there's a foul that stops a promising attack near midfield. Normally the free kick would be held up and the referee would come back and issue the caution for unsporting behavior, then ceremonially permit the free kick to proceed after the caution is given. Under this new rule, the attacking team may choose to take the free kick quickly to try to create a scoring opportunity, and as long as the referee has not started the procedure to issue the card, the attacking team may pursue that chance. When the next ball out of play opportunity presents itself, the guilty player for the original offense would then be cautioned. There are three conditions that need to be met for this permission. 1. The restart is a free kick. Only free kick restarts may be taken quickly in a misconduct situation. The law does not allow for other restarts. 2. The free kick creates a scoring opportunity. The idea is that the defender is going to be cautioned for stopping a promising attack, and allowing the quick free kick restores the promising attack. It is far less likely that a reckless tackle that occurs deep in the defensive third can be turned into a scoring opportunity, so allowing a quick restart from these sorts of situations is not recommended. 3. The quick restart can only be permitted as long as the referee has not become involved with either team through the misconduct procedure. It's important to clarify that any distraction by the referee, deliberate or accidental, would cause the defensive team to, quote, switch off. In these cases, the referee should make the restart ceremonial and issue the misconduct immediately. Lastly, it, the misconduct offense that is being delayed is denying a goal-scoring opportunity when the player is disciplined, it can only be a yellow card. You cannot allow a quick restart and then come back and issue a send-off for dog so. When you allow the quick restart, it's clear that the scoring opportunity was not in fact denied. Therefore, the incident can only be classified as stopping a promising attack, which is unsporting behavior and can only result in a caution. Another small clarification to misconduct in this year's law changes is that any misconduct for celebration of a goal stands even if the goal is disallowed. IFAB clarifies that any unsporting act or any act involving foul or abusive language or gestures is still punishable even if that act was executed in celebration of a goal that no longer exists. There were a few clarifications to situations that created specific types of restarts from particular offenses. Language was added to clearly indicate that any physical offense that is punished as a foul should result in a direct free kick or penalty kick. Any verbal offense, such as stopping play for dissent or for foul language, is always punished with an indirect free kick. If a player commits any kind of offense against an individual listed on that player's own team roster off the field, the restart is an indirect free kick to the opposing team on the boundary line closest to where the offense occurred. This is to clarify that offenses committed against non-opposing rostered individuals off the field of play always result in an indirect free kick. A player who throws or kicks an object other than the match ball at an opposing player, the restart would be a direct free kick at the location of the target. If a player throws or kicks anything including the match ball at a member of the opposing roster that is not a player, or a match official, the restart would be a direct free kick at the location of the target or on the boundary line closest to where the target was. The reference to kicking objects at individuals was added to clarify that this is not permitted either, except, obviously, kicking a ball that is in play at an opponent, which is just part of the game. There is a mechanics change to the indirect free kick signal. IFAB now allows the referee to bring the arm down immediately after the ball is kicked, if it is clear that the ball is not going to enter the goal directly from the indirect free kick. IFAB apparently figured out how dumb we look running around with our arm up in the air. Two changes have taken place regarding free kicks, one of which affects goal kicks as well. Remember, both goal kicks and free kicks taken from within a team's own penalty area traditionally have had to leave the penalty area to be in play. If anybody, the kicker, a teammate of the kicker, or an opponent played the ball before it left the penalty area, the play was blown dead, and the goal kick or free kick was retaken. This rule is now gone. The ball no longer has to leave the penalty area. It is in play when it is kicked and moves. Attackers must still yield 10 yards and exit the penalty area. So if an attacker fails to do this on a defensive free kick from within the penalty area or a goal kick and then challenges, the referee may plow the play dead and allow a retake. However, if the attacker has left the penalty area, 
Then the ball is played and the attacker rushes in and wins the ball before it leaves the penalty area. This is now allowed. This rule allows players to to play the ball short within the penalty area and eliminates repeated restarts that can occur from touches of the ball before it leaves the penalty area. In early August, IFAB made a few clarifications to the rule regarding the ball no longer having to leave the penalty area for free kicks and goal kicks. It took all of a few weeks for certain teams, like Benfica in this clip, to realize that the goalkeeper could lift the ball up to a defender's head or torso who is standing right next to the goalkeeper at a penalty area restart. The player could then head the ball back to the goalkeeper, and now the goalkeeper could distribute by punt or from his hands. I mean, what's the point of having new rules if you can't figure out clever ways to break them? IFAB has stated its rules committee is divided on this situation, so for the coming year such actions should be negated and the goal kick is retaken. We are fully aware there's an argument that this is using, quote, trickery to circumvent the back pass rule. However, IFAB has explicitly stated that an indirect free kick and yellow card are not to be given in this specific situation. If a team tries this stunt, blow your whistle and force a retake of the goal kick or free kick. Second, IFAB realized that a situation where a team taking a goal kick or free kick from within its own penalty area who plays quickly then misplays the ball into an attacker who has not had time to clear the penalty area should be treated like a free kick taken quickly. It is at the risk of the kicking team. The specific wording in the clarification is that, quote, the law is not there to save the kicking team from an error they make when they try to create an advantage from a quick restart. However, an attacker who deliberately remains within the penalty area in such situations should not benefit. It is the responsibility of the attackers to make an attempt to clear the penalty area, and misplayed restarts should only result in an opportunity for the attacking team if A. They have had no chance to clear the penalty area, or are at least attempting to clear the penalty area, and B. The ball is intercepted rather than interfered with. The second change is in regarding the formation of defensive walls. If the defending team at a free kick forms a wall of three players or more, then no attackers are permitted to stand closer than one yard from the wall until the ball is in play. This eliminates the jostling that occurs on walls as attackers try to push defenders out of the way to create a shooting lane. If an attacker is within one yard of a three-man or larger wall at a free kick, Play is immediately halted after the kick is taken and an indirect free kick is awarded to the defending team. Obviously, teams are not likely to be aware of this change, so warn the attacking players who are barging into the wall prior to the kick that their team is going to lose the ball if they do not move at least a yard away. If they don't, kill the play after the kick is taken and give an indirect free kick to the opposing team at the spot where the guilty player was. A few small modifications were made to Law 14 regarding penalty kicks. Added to the wording of the law is the requirement that the goalpost, crossbar, and net should not be moving prior to allowing the kick to proceed. This is a change designed to end the practice of tall goalkeepers jumping up and down and rattling the crossbar as a means to distract the kicker. They can still jump and down, up and down, but the referee should not blow the whistle to allow the kick to proceed until the goal frame is no longer shaking. The goalkeeper now only has to keep part of one foot on the goal line when the kick is taken rather than both feet, and is not allowed to be touching the crossbar goalposts or net at the taking of the kick. IFAB has opted to allow the goalkeeper to take one step because it also allows the kicker to stutter step in the run-up. Woo! That is a lot of changes. Again, most of these are small and some are fairly important. And we haven't even touched on the rules regarding giving cards to team officials and handling yet. Hold on to your butts, it's about to get real interesting.